Have you ever wondered what is the message that is so important it is located right at the center of the Bible? Well, let us establish first where is the center of the Bible. It is right there in the book of Psalms. Psalms is the longest book in the Bible. You will also find in Psalms the shortest chapter and the longest chapter. Guess what is the longest chapter in the book of Psalms? It is Psalms 119. And the shortest chapter is Psalms 117. And right at the center is Psalms 118 verse 8. And this is what it says. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. In this lecture presentation, we will be talking about target costing and pricing decisions, chapter 15 of your textbook. Decisions, decisions. Why are decisions so important? Well, it's because decisions determine destiny. In life, we definitely have to make a lot of decisions. And I pray that the main decision we will make is to put our trust in God. Let us pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, as we start yet another topic on target costing and pricing decisions, I pray, O oh Lord, that each one of us will make that decision to put our trust in you and to make you the leader of our lives. We ask, O oh Lord, for the Holy Spirit to fill us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In this topic, we are going to have seven learning objectives. Let's start with learning objective one. Here we'll describe the major influences on pricing decisions. Setting the price for an organization's product or service is perhaps one of the most important decision a manager faces. It is also one of the most difficult because there are a number of factors that must be considered. First, the company need to consider customer demand. Customer demand is very important in pricing decisions. Decisions regarding customers mean that the management must find the proper balance between perfect quality and perfect price if there is such a thing. Lower quality means lower price, but of course higher quality means higher price. So it is critical for the management to find the proper balance that their customers want. Competition is also another consideration in pricing decisions. If a competitor lowers its price for a similar product that a company is offering, then the company may have to match its price or they might risk losing their market share because of the competitor's action to reduce the price. Another consideration is, of course, the cost. Now, costs must be held below the market price of the product. In some businesses, the market determines the price. Management can only charge the market price, so it must ensure that its costs are below the price in order to make some profit. In the legal arena, there are certain laws regarding pricing policies that management must follow. For example, the law prohibits discriminating against customers when setting prices. So you can't just pick and choose which customer will you charge higher price and which customers will you charge lower price. Another restriction would be colluding. So collusion with other businesses in setting prices is also illegal. Now, public perception of unfair prices 
could cause political pressure on legislatures for regulatory relief from high prices. So there are actually industries that are highly regulated in terms of pricing, like for example, the utility companies. The government is actually monitoring and setting prices in those industries and also in other commodity products like, for example, rice, sugar, and the like. Now, the company's business image as well as its reputation may also rest on its pricing policies. Some businesses sell service with higher prices, but others rely on low prices, period. You may recall the two generic strategies, product differentiation and cost leadership. So depending on the company's chosen generic strategy, that would also impact on their pricing decisions. So the question now is, how are prices set? In many industries, both the cost as well as market forces will heavily influence prices. No organization or industry can price its products below its production costs indefinitely. And no company's management can set prices blindly at cost plus a markup without keeping an eye on the market. So in most cases, pricing can be viewed in either of these two ways. Prices may be based on costs subject to the reaction of the customers and competitors and Prices are determined by the market subject to costs being covered in the long run. So let us look at the first one, the cost plus pricing formula. And this is what we will cover in learning objective two. So what is the formula? It's simply price is equal to the cost plus the markup percentage multiplied by the cost. Now, depending on how cost is defined, the markup percentage may differ. So there are several different definitions of cost, each combined with a different markup percentage, and this can result in the same price for a product or service. We will use this unit cost information to illustrate the relationship between cost and markup that is necessary to achieve the desired unit sales price of $925. Now, we will see later how we reach that price of $925. Here, we are provided the variable manufacturing cost of $400, fixed manufacturing cost of 250 and therefore the full absorption manufacturing cost is $650. We also consider the variable selling and administrative cost of $50 and the fixed selling and administrative cost of $100. Therefore, the total cost is $800 for this product. So now let us have a look at the markup percentage if we are using the variable manufacturing cost. So applying the formula cost plus markup percentage times cost, if our price is set at $925 and we are using the variable manufacturing cost of $400, then the markup will work out to be 131.25%. So how did we get that? The price of 925 minus the variable manufacturing cost of 400 will give us $525 and then we'll divide that by 400 and we'll get 1.3125. Multiply that by 100 to get the percentage, 131.25%. What about if we base our calculation of the price on the total variable cost, which means that we will have to add the variable manufacturing cost of 400 plus the variable selling 
an administrative cost of 50 so that would give us 450 dollars so what should be our markup percentage if we want to achieve a price of 925 dollars we'll do similar calculation as what we have done here and we'll get 105.56 what you notice is as the cost base increases the required markup percentage declines so when our cost base is 400 our markup percentage was 131.25 when our cost increased to 450 our markup percentage decreased to 105.56 percent what if our markup is based on full manufacturing cost which is 650 dollars so our markup percentage will be even lower because our cost increased to 650 you'll notice that our markup percentage is now 42.31 percent and what if our markup is based on total cost 800 dollars our markup percentage in this case will be even lower at 15.63 how did we get all those markup percentages it's the same formula the price minus the cost divided by the cost and that would give you the markup percentage all right now let us consider the advantages and the disadvantages of using the absorption cost pricing formula you would recall in earlier topics that we have differentiated between absorption costing and variable costing. So the advantages of using the absorption cost pricing formula is that it will definitely cover all costs, whether variable or fixed. It is also perceived as equitable because it considers all costs. And it will allow for an easy comparison with competitors because absorption cost is used for external reporting purposes. And therefore, we are able to gather information about our competitors easily because they also use absorption costing for their external reporting purposes. So comparison will be much easier. On the downside though, full absorption unit price may obscure the distinction between variable and fixed costs now let's move on to variable cost pricing formula advantages firstly variable costing does not obscure cost behavior patterns because it necessitates the separation between variable costs and fixed costs also it does not require the fixed cost allocations, which is quite useful for managers to make decisions. On the downside though, if you are using variable costing, then fixed cost might be overlooked in pricing decisions. And this may result in prices that are too low to cover the total costs. Now this time, we will solve for the markup percentage that will yield the desired return on investment. You would recall that we have a price set at $925. So here is how we reach that figure. Recall from the example that we use 131.25% markup on variable manufacturing cost. How did we get that? Well, we used the $400 plus the profit. You know, markup is really the profit and that would give us the price of $925. So let's solve for that 131.25% and the $925 price that was set. Let's suppose that we have invested $300,000 in capital and the desired return on investment is 20%. There is also annual sales volume, 480 units given. So the first step is to solve for the income that will result in 
an ROI of 20%. So how do we calculate for that? If we know that ROI is 20% and our invested capital is 300,000, then our income must be 20% times 300,000, giving us $60,000 income. So next, we will now solve for the unit sales price that is necessary to result in an income of $60,000. So you will recall the figures provided there. We have the variable manufacturing cost of $400 and the total cost of $800. Because we are provided the information that we have 480 units volume of sales and our targeted income is 60,000. Therefore, when we multiply 480 times the unit profit margin, we should get 60,000. We know that in order to get the unit profit margin, we should deduct the unit cost from the unit sales price. Now the total unit cost is $800. Therefore, 480 times unit sales price, which we do not know, minus 800 should equal 60,000. So we will just have to transpose the formula. Unit sales price minus $800 should equal $60,000 divided by 480 units. So $60,000 divided by 480 is $125 per unit. So all we need to do now is to transpose the formula. Unit sales price, therefore, will be equal to $125 plus $800. And that would give us $925. So now that we know how we got the set price of $925, then we can move on to step three calculating the markup percentage on the $400 variable manufacturing cost that we have done earlier. So recall that markup percentage is simply the unit sales price minus the unit variable cost divided by the unit variable cost. So that is 925 minus 400 divided by 400 times 100 to show it in percentage and we get 131.25%. Now let's move on to learning objective 3. This is where we'll discuss the issues involved in strategic pricing of new products. Pricing a new product is a specially challenging decision problem. The newer the concept of the product, the more difficult it is to price that product. Pricing a new product is harder than pricing a product that is already mature in the market because of the magnitude of the uncertainties involved. Clearly, new products entail many uncertainties. For example, what obstacles will be encountered in manufacturing the product and what will be the cost of production. So production cost is one of the major factors to take into account. But the other one is market acceptance. After the product is produced and made available to the public, will anyone want to buy this product and at what price? You can imagine, if I invented this helmet that when you put it on, you can have photographic memory. Now that is a new concept, new product in the market. Would you want to have one? Well, I certainly would like to try it and see how much my brain can actually absorb. But how much would the market be willing to pay for such an ingenious product? Now, in addition to the production and demand uncertainties, new products also pose another sort of challenge. There are two widely differing strategies that a manufacturer of a new product can adopt. They could either use skimming or they could use the market penetration strategy. 
when the company uses skimming, the company will set the initial price, offer price for the new product at a very high price. And gradually, they will lower the price to appeal to a broader market. So skimming is a strategy that is good when they would like to portray that this product is mainly for the elite. So an example of a product that used this skimming pricing strategy was when the high-definition television was introduced in the market. Initially, high-definition televisions were priced quite high and this product was only affordable to a few buyers. Eventually, though, the price was lowered and high-definition TVs were purchased now by a wide range of consumers. Now, an alternative initial pricing strategy is called market penetration. Here, the initial price is set low with the intention to quickly gain the market share. Management hopes to penetrate the new market deeply. As such, this pricing approach is often used for products that are of good quality but do not stand out as vastly better than competing products. Now, the decision between scheming or market penetration pricing strategy would depend on the type of product and it involves a trade-off between the prices versus the volume or the quantity. Scheming pricing results in much slower acceptance of a new product but higher unit profits. Penetration pricing results in greater initial sales volume or quantity but lower unit profits. Now, another issue that we need to take into account when pricing are the legal restrictions on setting prices. I've already mentioned earlier about discrimination in pricing. So companies are not free to set any price they wish for their products or services. There are a number of antitrust laws, including the Robinson Patman Act in the U.S., Clayton Act, Sherman Act, and all these laws restrict certain types of pricing behavior. So these laws prohibit price discrimination, which means quoting different prices to different customers for the same product or service. Such price differences are unlawful unless they can be clearly justified by differences in the costs incurred to produce, sell, or deliver the products or service. Managers should keep careful records in order to justify such cost differences when they exist because the records may be vital to a legal defense if price differences are challenged in court. Now, another pricing practice that is prohibited by law is called predatory pricing. This practice involves temporarily cutting the price to broaden the demand for a product with the intention of later restricting the supply and raising the price again. Now, in determining whether the price is predatory, the courts will examine a business's cost records. If the product is sold below cost, the pricing is deemed to be predatory. The laws and court cases are ambiguous as to the appropriate definition of cost though. However, various court decisions make it harder to prove predatory pricing. But nevertheless, this is one area where a price setting decision maker is well advised to have an accountant as well as a lawyer by his side in order to ensure that they are not deemed to be predatory or discriminatory. All right, let us now move on to learning objective four. 
we will identify and discuss here the key principles of target costing. You would recall earlier that we mentioned the two views in setting prices. One is to set the price based on cost, and that's cost-based pricing. And the other is to set the price that is determined by the market. And this is target costing. So under target costing, market research will determine the price at which a new product will sell. Then the management will compute the manufacturing cost that will provide an acceptable profit margin. And finally, the engineers and cost analysts will design a product that can be made for the allowable cost. Note that there are seven key principles of target costing. So the first principle in target costing is that it is price-led. Target costing sets the target cost by first determining the price at which the product will be sold in the marketplace and then will deduct the target profit margin from this target price in order to reach the target cost. The second principle is that it is focus on customer. To be successful at target costing, the management must listen to the company's customers. What products do they want? What features are important? How much are they willing to pay for a certain level of product quality? Management will have to be aggressively seeking customer feedback if they want to adapt target costing. Then the products must be designed to satisfy the customer demand and it must be sold at a price that the customers are willing to pay. In short, target costing approach is market driven. Another principle of target costing is that it's focused on product design. Design engineering is a key element in target costing. The engineers must design a product from the ground up so that it can be produced at its target cost. This design activity includes specifying the raw materials and components to be used as well as the labor, the machinery, and other elements of the production process. In short, a product must be designed for manufacturability. Another key principle in target costing is that it is focused on process design. As indicated earlier, every aspect of the production process must be examined to make sure that the product is produced as efficiently as possible. The use of technology, global sourcing in procurement, and every aspect of the production process must be designed with the product's target cost in mind. Another key principle of target costing is that it needs cross-functional teams. Manufacturing a product at or below its target cost would require the involvement of people from many different functions in the organization. So they will include the market research, the sales, design engineers, procurement, so the purchasing, production engineering, production scheduling, materials handling, and of course, cost management. So all these different individuals from different departments of the organization may be diverse and they have different areas of expertise and they can make key contributions to the target costing process. In addition, a cross-functional team is not a set of specialists who contribute their expertise and then leave they are responsible for the entire product. Another key principle of target costing is that it has to take into account life cycle costs. So when specifying a product's target cost, analysts must be careful to incorporate 
all of the product's life cycle cost. So what do these include? It includes the cost of the product planning and concept design, the preliminary design, the detailed design, testing, production, distribution, and customer service. So it's not just the manufacturing cost that should be taken into account. You know, traditional cost accounting system have tended to focus only on the production phase, how much direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead will be incurred. And they have not taken into account the entire life cycle cost of the product. But in target costing, it needs to be incorporated. And finally, value chain orientation is another key principle in target costing. So sometimes the projected cost of a new product is above target cost. If that is the case, then efforts must be made to eliminate non-value added costs to bring the projected cost down. So it's important to conduct analysis of which costs are value adding and which costs are not value adding. In some cases, a close look at the company's entire value chain will help managers to identify opportunities for cost reduction. So I just want to emphasize that target costing is a system of profit planning and cost management. So target costing is in fact a cost management technique, not just a product costing technique. So what exactly is a target cost in that sense? It's simply the difference between the sales price that is needed to capture a predetermined market share and the desired per unit profit. So here is a very simple example. Let's suppose that we are in a building industry. We build houses according to customer specifications. Now, the current product specification and the targeted market share call for a sales price of 250000 per house built. This is perhaps a four-bedroom, two-car garage, two-bathroom home. If the company has a required profit of 50000 per unit, then we can calculate how much should be the target cost. So it's simply the target selling price of 250000 minus the target profit of 50000 and that would give us the target cost of $200,000. Now, whilst we're here, I would like to introduce the difference between markup and margin. We've already looked at markup earlier. Markup is simply the profit as a percentage of cost, all right? Margin, on the other hand, is also profit, but it's profit as a percentage of sales. So in this illustrative example, the markup can be easily calculated. It is profit, which is 50,000, divided by the cost. Remember that markup is profit as a percentage of cost. So to calculate markup, we'll just divide 50,000 by 200,000 times 100, and so we'll get 25%. Now, if you want to convert markup to margin, all we have to do is to divide the markup of 25 by 100 plus the markup of 25, and that would give us 0.2 or 20%. Remember that margin is also profit, but it is profit over sales. So to calculate the margin percentage, it's simply 50,000 divided by the selling price of 250,000 times 100, so that is 20%. So you can see that that is exactly the calculated margin when we converted markup to margin. And if you like to convert margin to markup, it's simply the margin of 20 divided by 100 minus the margin of 20, 
So that would give us 0.25 or 25%. This is useful whenever you are given the margin, for example, and then it's the cost that is given. So you can't just say, oh, so how much is the profit if the cost is 200,000 and the margin percentage is 20%. You can't just get 20% of 200,000 to calculate for the profit because 20% of 200,000 is 40,000. So you would have calculated it wrongly. If you do have the cost and the margin percentage, then convert that margin to markup first and then you can calculate the profit easily. Once it's converted to 25% times 200,000, you know that the profit is 50,000. All right, let's go on to learning objective five. Here we will explain the process of value engineering and its role in target costing. It is interesting to note that target costing is actually an outgrowth of the concept of value engineering, which is a cost reduction and process improvement technique that utilizes information collected about a product's design and production processes, and then examines the various attributes of the design and processes to identify the candidates for improvement efforts. So whilst target cost information will require product design, product costs, and production processes, you would recall that you actually calculate the target cost backwards under target costing, right? You will be setting the target price first based on the market share objective and product functionality according to customer demands. Then we will calculate the target profit according to company policy and we'll get the target cost. Target price minus target profit is equal to target cost. Once we know the target cost, we will check out our product and process design. Then we'll ask the question, have we met the target cost? If our answer is no, then you might have to proceed to further looking at how you can reduce the cost, how you can improve the design, and how you can improve the processes. And that is in fact what value engineering entails. So once you have looked at the product and process design, with the intention of reducing the cost in order to reach the target cost, you will again ask the question, have we met the target cost? And if we have, then we can start with the production and achieve the profit target for that particular product or service. All right, so now let's move on to learning objective six. Here, we will learn to determine prices using the time and material pricing approach. Under this approach, the company determines one charge for the labor used on a job and another charge for the materials. So the labor typically includes the direct cost of the employee's time and a charge to cover the various overhead costs. The material charge generally includes the direct cost of the materials used in a job plus a charge for material handling and storage. Now, time and material pricing is used widely by construction companies, printers, repair shops, and professional service firms such as engineering, law, and public accounting firms. Time charges are calculated by taking the hourly labor cost plus overhead per hour and a profit margin, then multiplying the sum by the total labor hours used and the material charges on the other hand are equal to the total material cost plus the overhead per dollar of material cost times the material cost incurred. 
Now let's move on to our final learning objective. And this is where we'll recall how to set prices in special order or competitive bidding situations by analyzing relevant costs. In a competitive bidding, Two or more companies will submit sealed bids for a project, a service, or a product to a potential buyer. So it is sealed and therefore the company do not know how much will the competitors be bidding. So the buyer will select one of the companies for the job on the basis of the bid price and the design specifications for the job. Competitive bidding complicates a manager's pricing problem because now the manager is in direct competition with one or more competitors and if all the companies submitting bids offer roughly equivalent products or service, the bid price becomes the sole criterion for selecting the contractor. The higher the price that is bid, the greater will be the profit on the job if the firm gets the contract. However, a higher price also lowers the probability of obtaining the contract to perform the job. Of course, the reverse would be true as well. If you put in a low bid price, there is a higher probability of winning the bid, but there is low profit if you win the bid. So there is a trade-off between bidding high to make good profit or bidding low to land the contract. So there are some people who would say that there is what they call the winner's curse in competitive bidding. The winner's curse simply means that the company bidding low enough to beat out its competitors probably bid too low to make an acceptable profit on the job. Now, despite the winner's curse, competitive bidding is a common form of selecting contractors in many types of business. These are some guidelines for bidding. If the company bidding has excess capacity, then it's likely that the company can afford to put in a low bid price. Any bid price in excess of the company's incremental costs for the job will contribute to the fixed cost and, of course, profit for the bidder. However, if the bidding company has no excess capacity, then it is likely that this company will have a high bid price. The bid price should be the full cost plus the normal profit margin because the winning bid will have to displace any existing work for the bidding company. And more likely, this existing work is making some profit. All right. Now let's have a look at this illustrative example. We will discuss problem 15-39. Here we have North American pharmaceuticals and they specialize in packaging bulk drugs in standard dosages for the local hospitals. The company has been in business for several years and they have been profitable since the second year of operation. The assistant controller installed a standard costing system after joining the company three years ago. Now they have a prospective customer, Wyant Memorial Hospital, and this hospital asked the pharmaceutical company to bid on the packaging of 1 million doses of medication at total cost plus a return on total cost of no more than 15%. Wyant defines total cost as including all variable costs of performing the service, a reasonable amount of fixed overhead, and reasonable administrative costs. The hospital will supply all packaging materials and ingredients, and 
Wyant, the hospital, has indicated that any bid over 0 0.015 per dose will be rejected. This information has been accumulated by the assistant controller of the pharmaceutical company and we'll use this to prepare for the bid. So let us have a look at the first requirement. We are asked to calculate the minimum price per dose that the pharmaceutical company could bid for the hospital's job that would not reduce the pharmaceutical company's income. So to calculate for the minimum price per dose, we'll need to first calculate the direct labor hours required for the job. We are told that the hospital would like a bid for 1 million doses and the production rate is 2,000 doses per direct labor hour. So when we divide 1 million doses by 2,000 doses per direct labor hour, we will get 500 direct labor hours. All right, now we can calculate the costs. We will have the direct labor cost. It's stated here at $8 per direct labor hour. So it's $8 times the 500 that we've calculated, that's $4,000. We are also told that variable cost per direct labor hour is $6. So $6 times 500 is 3000 And the administrative costs that are incremental for this particular bid is $1,000 per order. So our total traceable out-of-pocket cost will be $8,000. The minimum price per dose can now be calculated by dividing the total traceable out-of-pocket cost of 8,000 by the 1 million doses. And so that would give us 0 0.008. It's sounding promising because the minimum price per dose is definitely lower than the maximum bid price that is acceptable to Wyant Hospital. Let's go to requirement two. Calculate the bid price per dose using total cost and the maximum allowable return specified by Wyant Memorial Hospital. So here we've already calculated direct labor, direct variable overhead as per requirement one. We've also got the administrative cost, but we need to now include the fixed overhead. So fixed overhead, as stated here, is $10 times the 500 direct labor hours needed for this bid, and that would give us $5,000. So the total cost is $13,000. And we are told that to bid on the packaging, the hospital requires no more than 15% of what? Of the total cost. So we'll calculate 15% of 13,000 and that would give us 1,950. Therefore, the total bid price is $14,950. Let's calculate that per dose. So $14,950 divided by 1 million doses and that gives us 0 0.01495 per dose. We are still below the maximum price that was set at 0 0.015, so that's promising. Let's go to number three. Now, independent of your answer to requirement two, suppose that the price per dose that North American Pharmaceuticals calculated using the cost plus criterion as specified by the hospital is greater than the maximum bid of 0 0.015 per dose allowed by the hospital. We are asked to discuss the factors that the pharmaceutical company's management should consider before deciding whether or not to submit a bid at the maximum price of 0 0.015 per dose that the hospital allows. So what are the factors? If our calculated total bid price was more than 15 cents, what other factors would we consider? Supposing that the price computed by the pharmaceutical company using the hospital's criterion is greater than 0 0.015, 
the factors that the pharmaceutical company has to consider before they decide whether or not to submit a bid at the maximum allowable price would be, first, they have to consider do they have excess capacity or not. If they do have excess capacity, then they can lower their bid. You know, anything above the out-of-pocket cost will be acceptable. But if they don't have any excess capacity, then perhaps it's not worth going for the bid. What else? Whether there are available jobs on which earnings might be better or greater. If there are other jobs, for example, not only from Wyant Hospital, maybe another hospital is asking them to bid, they might take that into account first. And finally, whether the maximum bid of 0.015 contributes towards covering the fixed cost. If it covers the fixed cost and it's above the total out-of-pocket cost, they might still take it into account. All right. And that concludes this lecture on target costing and pricing decisions. I'd like to end with this quote from Graham Brown. He said, life is about choices. Some we regret, some we're proud of, some will haunt us forever. The message is this, we are what we choose to be. So the question is what? would you choose may i suggest taking into account this favorite bible verse of mine proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6 it says trust in the lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he god shall direct thy paths may we make the decision to always trust God and put Him first so that He can lead us into the right path. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we would like to conclude this lecture presentation by acknowledging You as our Lord and Savior. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we will continue to trust You fully so that you can guide us and lead us unto the path that you want for us to go through. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget your post-lecture required activities and please complete it before the deadline. I'll see you in class shortly. Bye-bye for now.